Hi, I'm Austin Wintry, and this is part two of my series, Composer Points of View, in which I went to 10 colleagues and friends of mine and asked them the same five questions where the general premise was, what are questions that I don't think I've ever been asked that I'd be interested to hear their takes on. As a side note, in the previous video, I did a fairly lengthy intro about each of the 10 composers, so I refer you to that video, plus I've linked to their socials below. This question was inspired by my collaboration a few years ago with the Alosh Ensemble, a group of throat singers and instrumentalists from Tuba that I was collaborating with on The Pathless for Giant Squid. Normally I write things pretty meticulously, and before we ever go into a studio. But in the case of The Pathless and specifically working with Alosh, it was not the right way to collaborate with them. And one of my big epiphanies was that we should just improvise together and jam and let the material evolve organically. And then later I can add things like nickel harpa and orchestral musicians and that sort of thing. And I had never worked that way. It represented a massive disruption in my process. So much so, and I loved it so much that I thought I should try doing this more often. I should make this kind of a regular feature of my work. And I found myself wondering if any of my friends had had experiences similar to that, where something came along and just wildly changed how they write music. So that's what I asked them. And the results were all over the map. I am continually doing that. I mean, it's almost like for me to settle in and be like, I've been working with the same template the same way for two years now. I can't even say that. I've never been able to say that. I, I mean, just off the top of my head, I made a massive switch from digital performer to Cubase two years ago. I philosophically changed from being, well, my demos don't need to sound good, whatever. I just use crappy samples and I use live orchestra to no, the demos should sound real. And then I use live orchestra, but, but my expression uh changed um my team set up expression mapping this is gonna get technical sorry expression mapping to access more samples i have surround speakers i put those up now to sort of like okay i'm gonna do everything i can to make it sound like it's on a dub stage uh when i'm writing i mean that if you told me that even three years ago i would have looked you in the eye and said i would never in a million years waste my time doing that and in fact, it was my staff that kept saying, you ought to try Cubase, we can get you more flexibility. And I was like, no, no. And without telling me, they spent six months building my template in Cubase and said, now we have it, will you sit down and try it? And I was like, fine. Wow, and it changed, the, it changed the way I, I think, it changed the way I write. Um, and I'm always looking for new ways of doing that. Just when I scored foundation, I. We worked on some custom software that that you know with arpeggiators and stuff that i again i normally would have been like i would never do that i sequence every single little note i would never let a computer choose the notes are you nuts so i think i'm always evolving and that's the fun of our job mm, oh i think it's loki like um i'd never written a suite before uh i'd never kind of like sat down and had like months and months to kind of come up with this themes with the different characters and um just you know it was like a real luxury to have all that time and and I, I did like live recordings and finding the instrument and the palette that I wanted to use and stuff um and yeah that 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 was kind of a shift in my process because I'd usually jump in a bit sooner and start scoring to picture and actually um that's been a real good lesson in in, in so that's something Max Richter mentioned in in that speech that he that he gave when we went to see it was like, um, make sure your your themes are really durable and they hold up and and then if you've got a strong theme you can kind of mod move it around and and shift it into different contexts and stuff and um, I think that's so true and actually you know sometimes I listen back to older work where I haven't had that time to really form those solid themes at the beginning and. Yeah, the, the work doesn't hold up. Black Widow uh, being on liquid morphine. Um, <laughs> basically, my back had gone out and um, I literally, uh, for the pain, I was on I was on morphine. It was that was, bad, wow. Oh, it was horrendous. It was, it, I, when, when people say about bad packs, I always used to like, like, you know, it can't be that bad. And when that disc, I sneezed, 
of walking to the bathroom. <laughs> I sneezed and it, but the L5 or L4 popped out. That made me kind of stop l treating things so, so uh, looking at things with a formula. Weirdly enough, mm. I love I love structure and formula, and and with and with morphine, it rela it kind of set took me out of it, and kind of just felt more liberal about trying new things. Um, I'm not comparing myself to the Beatles' second album when they were all on, <laughs> but it but it, it it just stopped it stopped me from worrying about is it you know should the tune do this is it catchy enough. I'm not suggesting everybody does it. When I lived in New York for the first two games that we made, I was remote and everybody else was in the office in, in San Francisco. And I had developed a method of working remotely just from home all the time. And that was all well and good. And then I moved to the Bay Area and started working from the office and had to learn how to work in a space. I never worked in an office in my life. So I had to like just learn how to do that uh, and learn how to kind of keep the work contained within the hours I was at the office and when I was home try to separate to stop doing that and so and then I, I got pretty good at that over you know the next couple of games we did fire and, and Haiti most of Hades and then uh the pandemic hit like six months before we had to ship Hades so I had to kind of relearn I didn't really have the gear at home it was all at the office I had to kind of reset up a home studio and relearn how to stay on task and work from home with my family and all that stuff uh, happening and, and everybody being here all the time and and just figure all that stuff out again so i would say that was a pretty significant disruption but 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 the necessity of just having a bunch of work to do kind of kept mm. made me figure it all out very quickly <laughs> but like every once in a while i'll, I'll try. in fact at the start of every project i sort of tune the way that my templates work to be a little bit more um, just easier to work. Um, the last big change uh, is this, just having a lot more hardware synthesizers and a mm. lot more, you know, physical gear. This as well, you know, I've gotten into tape. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, a little, but, yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, there's like a um, upcoming score that's kind of more on like the horror side of things. And I really wanted to explore tape for that one. Um, and I love it. I love the sound of tape. I've actually run like entire sample libraries. I've resampled them uh, and then put them on cassette tape and then have them play back and re-recorded it back in and like with Ferris speed and all kinds of you know funny stuff like that. I worked on this film, The Reason I Jump, and that was that really opened my eyes up to uh, you know, on every project I wanted to push process and uh and and, and challenge myself. And so that well, that was great fun because you know the normal if there's a normal process, it's a case of uh, composing in front of your computer, um, mocking everything up, bring musicians at the end, record, mix, deliver. And with this project, because I was brought on so early, we had the ability to, um, and the time to experiment, where there was no right or wrong. And that was so refreshing because I, being slightly OCD, you know, being a perfectionist and be, or being, you know, always wanting to be in control of every single note that I compose, um, I decided to be much more collaborative with musicians and uh, do held semi-improvised recording sessions, which was really, really exciting. Um, slightly scary for me because, I, you know, I'd book in... Um, a great musician so okay we've got this day we're going to do a violin session and i'd have lots of sketches planned out and i'd have a rough idea of what i wanted in my head but the ability to bring it i cast my musicians really carefully so that um you know i'll, I'll listen to their music and i think oh i think they've just got the the right touch to bring something really fresh and exciting to this. So I'd bring in a violinist, for example, or a cellist, and play them my sketches and then direct them on the fly. And I I wouldn't print any sheet music, which is, oh my God, that is diving into the unknown. Um, and this is with classically trained musicians, which would make them feel uncomfortable. And, and I'd uh, sing them melodies. 
and then they would play and semi-improvise. So I brought in this piece, for example, where I brought in this cellist and um, she's autistic uh, and the, the, the film is about non-verbal autism and she's autistic herself. So that, so she was incredibly hypersensitive and perceptive to uh, the storytelling and, uh, and the nuances of what I was trying to achieve. So that was really fascinating. And so I said, okay, we're gonna record, start from a blank slate, just record a line of cello, okay? Um, I have a click track and I'm going to point my finger upwards when I want you to go up a tone. I'm gonna point my finger downwards when I want you to go down a tone. And if I point my finger down again, you'll go down a tone again. And we'd have, um, and but you can only play these five notes of the scale. And oh my God, God, I don't know what I'm doing here. She was thinking, you're nuts, Nanita. And uh, but I thought, okay, let's just try this. And we did it, we recorded the line, and then we did it again. And I played back the first line, and then we did went through the same process, pointing my finger upwards, downwards. And I was literally just vibing off what, she, what we had been listening to that very second. And we carried on doing that. And we were just, our eyes were, our pupils were dilating you thought wow look look at the sound that we're creating and we did it about six or seven times and we had this amazing sea of cello waves of cello lines undulating and interweaving and and there was no dissonance there was no wasn't clashing but it was just this most inc most incredible sound and um and that really um, was very, very insightful for me to to work like that. I guess what I can think about is like specifically on this series that I'm working on, um, the Gremlins one. It's like it's music that's so challenging for me to write, I guess. And and there's a lot of um, like challenging because it's it's fully orchestral and it's that stuff that I do, but I I it's even it's even deeper than I've ever gone you know like where it's I mean oftentimes we do like a hybrid score you know something like that and there's no hybrid in this it's just it's just straight up um orchestral and you know anyway so but I I don't know there there's they there's been a lot of opportunity on the show to do things that are really specific like there was one there's one I mean I don't I don't think it's I think it's okay to say these things I guess but there's one thing that one character that really called for a deep dive for me into Chinese opera. And if you've ever listened to Chinese opera, it, that's not that's not music that I can relate to or resonate with. Like that's music that I find difficult to listen to, to be honest. Um, even talking to my dad about it, he's like, oh yeah, my mom listened to that all growing up and, you know, all the time. And it's, and it's I mean, it's, it's, it's really f kind of far out there if you ever, anyway. But it kind of, it required to, to go in deep and figure out, well, like what you know what if i'm gonna write i'm not i wasn't writing chinese opera but i was writing like something to like hearken to that in some way and it was kind of like this doesn't support drama in the way that we support drama like yeah. the way that we generally support drama on these types of shows or anything like that so i don't know i this is, maybe it's not a really good answer but i just but it was just one of those things where like, i really had to sit there and think far more than i've ever had to think before about how to incorporate you know it, you know, how to incorporate a, a style. It's not the most recent thing anymore, but um, one of the biggest changes to my personal workflow was when I decided I'm going to play the keyboard. Like, I'm just going to, <laughs> you know, uh, stop sequencing things um, quite as often and just play things in um, by hand um, whenever possible. And that was that was around the time that I was working on Celeste, where I had a lot of you know piano lines in there that I wanted to feel like were evocative of me, like as a, as a player, um, more so than just playing back the MIDI in a way. Um, and that was just kind of a total shift for me where like since then I've just played in literally everything every synth you know whatever it is and you know if it's meant to be super quantized then I'll super quantize it if it's meant to be free then I'll let it be or like tweak you know the MIDI data or whatever but like I literally don't go to the piano roll ever anymore um I just 
just stick with playing things in by hand. Um, and the main exception is if I'm working in like a, a tracker or something where like you kind of have to, but um, otherwise, yeah, like that totally changed how I approach writing music. I try and swap up my process as much as I can. So like even this year, like, like, like during COVID, I was doing like, I was doing a bunch of projects, but I was doing this one called uh, Welcome to Earth, which is this Will Smith and Darren Aronofsky kind of natural history series for Nat Geo. And I, I, I've done something with Darren before uh, called One Strange Rock. And the idea is we're gonna do more of the same, which was like basically insane visuals, very weird electronic abstract music. Um, and the thing that was fun for that was also like the COVID aspect was being like, right, I've got to do everything myself. So I'm going to do everything like, you know, kind of no real life players. Everything's got to be done in this room. Um, you know, whereas some other schools would be like, right, it's a big orchestral process. I'm, I'm working this way. So it was fun to go back to doing something that was kind of very electronic and almost like track driven rather than picture driven there was some stuff that was picture driven but it meant you could sort of go a bit more crazy with automation and things that you might not do if the cue's changing every five minutes and then i also had the aaron sorkin movie uh being the ricardos and that was a completely different process that was like sit a piano and write a theme and like start off you know really spend a long time naming a theme that musically will work across the whole film in lots of different iterations and um, variants. And again, that's just a lovely thing of just sitting at a piano and just really pondering notes, which you often don't do, I think, sometimes because often you have to write very quickly um, or you're just making a scene work. Whereas this one, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, well, if I literally play a D or an E here, this slightly changes the, the feel of the melody, which one feels right for this and really making those decisions that are like quite seem quite minor but you add them all up and it all you know it really pulls something together and so that was again a really nice change of pace because you can't if you're doing like some of my scores are very production orientated um of course yeah and so so you know i'm trying to do like very unusual approaches or very um uh like more sonic approaches than than musicality you know i try to put musicality in there definitely but it's like i'm approaching it more from a sonic's point of view and that involves a lot of experimentation and just kind of slowly finding a way there whereas a singer piano is such a lovely like experience of just like um uh of it just you know uh just writing music somebody said to me once they they change the studio every two years the, the design of it wow. so they'll change the direction of the rig mm -hmm. um and i thought i it, i thought that's a good, quite that's a quite good you know it's it's it's, it's expensive to keep <laughs> changing all the yeah, time that's a great idea though um but but just changing the the, the sofa to a different place or certain and um but I, it's difficult because it's like i've now got a new a new studio and and um and I think differently. I must say, I think totally differently. Basically, I work with a template, as does so many people, depending on what projects you're on. But it's just for ease of use. And, you know, I love all my keyboards and everything else, and it's great for noodling about on. But you don't have time all the time, you know, for for movie work and for TV work. So you just got to sort of get in there, and that's when you use the soft sense. But I was like, all right, his film, I'm completely sort of glossied out from a point of view of everything was too perfect on that last score. I got rid of my template and the whole film was about analog processes and it was about analog processes and photography. Mm. And it was about Elsa Dorfman and Elsa Dorfman is an incredible photographer who had a, I want to say a six foot or a seven foot Polaroid camera. <laughs> and there were only about six of these in the world. And her thing was that she would take pictures of people like portraits and of course it's not like now it's like ding 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 you can take five thousand pictures you get two for every photo shoot because of course the paper is <laughs> yeah i didn't even know that was physical <laughs> I'll, I'll back. the paper is that big <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so she's like well you get one outtake and then she gets to keep one that was the deal 
Um, and she said she hated doing relationship phot uh, photographs because people always would break up or this or that. So it was more <laughs> kind of, so, and you can see it. She's like, and I've only got two pictures to do of this. So anyway, so, but it was, then the fact was the Polaroid were getting, they weren't making any more of this paper and the company got sold off and so on. So it was, well, it was all very analog versus digital, digital world taking over from the analog world. So her career was, I mean, by that stage she was getting on a bit anyway, but she's like, so my career will last for as long as there is this paper because after that I'm done, no one else is making this paper. So I was like, well, this is a really interesting point of view. So well, if the digital world is ruining the analog, then let's come full circle on this. And it's not groundbreaking, but for me as a composer, it was very refreshing then. I got rid of the template, I got rid of all my synths, and I just played everything in live, which is how I started off when I was working with my hands. It's like, you know, you're just on a tape, tape to tape. And so the thing about tape to tape is the same as using what they call not Steinbeck machines, but editors, where it's the, the old kind of um, like the, the film. That, what like a moviola, you mean? Like uh, what was the movie? What was the company that wasn't Steinbeck? It was Stein. God, God. Anyway, but the editors say the same. It's like it give, used to give them time to get to the energy of the film and the flow of the film and to get the pace of the film. Whereas now it's like, okay, chop, chop, chop. Now let's watch it. No, you've got to wait for the reel to rewind, which gives your brain 30 seconds to get yourself back. And that used to be the same when you're playing piano. It's like the first and foremost, number one rule you can give people when you're recording people in the studio is don't just go, right, give me another tape, give me another tape, give me another tape. Because as an artist, you need to have time to think about what you're doing and to think about your performance. And you're not going to get any difference between take one and take two if it's just ding, 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 ding. Right. So it's, and you only realize that when you're at the other end of the headphone. So get yourself out of the control room, get in there, get behind a piano or a drum kit, whatever it is you're doing. And then you suddenly realize, oh, fuck, this is quite hard. Yeah, can you just give me 30 seconds? I need to get my brain together because I've had earphones on now for four hours and I can't hear a thing. So anyway, so the point is on this film, I recorded everything in live and I did everything on one take. There were no redos. So there's a lot of analog hiss going on in the soundtrack. There are a lot of kind of my analog keyboards going on and I recorded those. So the only digital thing was the actual digital former or Pro Tools or whatever we were recording on. And we recorded the quartet and the double bass. And they were all like, okay, that's great, let's do another. No, we're not doing another, that's it. What the hell do you mean? And you know what professional musicians are like. Yeah, they the, don't like that. <laughs> my B flat, it was so out of chicken. <laughs> and, you know, and I listened to Nick Patel's, obviously the succession theme uh, recently, and I hear some of the strings going, ooh, but it's wonderful because it's not perfect. And I'm sure it was intentional as well, but there's a few kind of sketchy moments on it. And I'm like, that's gotta be an intentional thing or the sound of those strings, whatever it is. Uh, but it really adds to the warmth. And I remember that with the B side doing the same. It's like the, the musicians were horrified. Mm -hmm. And I was like, just trust me. And it was, say it wasn't a massive orchestra, but it was a quartet and then it was a double bass and there was lots of guitar on it and shit like that. And whatever it was just went on, didn't get chopped up. It was just a one take thing. And the sound of it by the end of it was like, it's been used loads on like other stuff, so it can't be shit. But like the sound of it was actually really different to anything I've done before, just because I had a certain warmth to it, I guess. So did I learn anything from it? Probably not, yeah, because now back to my template, but it was a really refreshing <laughs> part of it. You know? <laughs>